pelvic inflammatory disease refers to an ascending polymicrobial infection and inflammation of the female genital tract, which can include the cervix, uterus, fallopian tubes, ovaries, and the surrounding structures. The pathophysiology involves infection from the vagina and cervix ascending into the upper genital tract. Often, this is facilitated by epithelial damage by organisms like Chlamydia trachomatis or Neisseria gonorrhea, which then facilitates other microorganisms to enter, such as anaerobes, urea plasma, haemophilus, and enteric gram negatives. Bacterial vaginosis can also facilitate this ascent by disrupting the normal vaginal flora. In severe cases, inflammation may spread to the peritoneum, the inner membrane that lines the abdomen and pelvis, resulting in peritonitis, which can be life-threatening. It can also spread to involve the liver capsule, called perihepatitis, also known as Fitzhugh-Curtis syndrome, and this can lead to development of adhesions between the liver capsule and the abdominal wall, sometimes called violin string adhesions. Other complications like hydrosalpinx, meaning blockage of fluid in the fallopian tubes, and tubo ovarian abscess can also develop. The signs and symptoms are variable depending on the organs involved, and also bear in mind that the severity of the inflammation may not correlate with the severity of symptoms. Typical symptoms of PID include lower abdominal or pelvic pain. This can be present particularly if the fallopian tubes are affected and is often bilateral but may be unilateral. Abnormal cervical or vaginal discharge. This may be mucopurulent discharge that is often yellow or green. Abnormal uterine bleeding including irregular vaginal bleeding, especially post or intermenstrual bleeding. Inflammation of the uterus, termed endometriitis, can lead to the irregular bleeding. Fever is another common feature. Other features include nausea, vomiting and malaise, and dyspareunia, meaning pain on intercourse, is also a common finding. In Fitzhugh-Curtis syndrome, there may be right upper quadrant pain, and episodes may become chronic and feature intermittent episodes of PID or pain. A tubo ovarian abscess is a collection of pus within the adnexa, which can result in pain and fever, as well as potentially peritonitis and sepsis. This tends to follow salpingitis, meaning inflammation of the fallopian tubes, in around 15% of cases, and there may be a mass on palpation. Hydrosalpinx tends to be asymptomatic, but may present with chronic pelvic pain or pressure. Infertility is another potential complication of PID experienced in around 20% of cases, as well as there being an increased risk of ectopic pregnancy following salpingitis due to adhesions and scarring of the tubules. PID is traditionally thought to be caused by sexually transmitted organisms, such as Chlamydia trachomatis, believed to cause between 14 and 35% of cases, Neisseria gonorrhea, and Mycoplasma genitalium, alongside various anaerobic and aerobic bacteria often associated with bacterial vaginosis, for example, Gardnerella. Others, as mentioned, include urea plasma, Haemophilus, and enteric gram negatives. Risk factors include prior PID or presence of an STI or bacterial vaginosis. As such, risk factors for STI and bacterial vaginosis are also risk factors for PID, including age under 35, new or multiple sexual partners, unprotected intercourse, douching, and recent intrauterine instrumentation such as IUD insertion or abortion. The diagnosis is clinical and should be considered early in sexually active females of reproductive age, especially with risk factors present. 
The minimum diagnostic criteria on pelvic exam include one of three signs. Cervical motion tenderness, also known as the chandelier sign, meaning pain on manipulation of the cervix, getting the chandelier sign name due to the severity of the pain causing an involuntary movement reaching upwards, as if grabbing a chandelier. Another is uterine tenderness or adnexal tenderness, which was found to have a sensitivity of 96%, but a low specificity at 4%. Lab investigations include pregnancy tests to rule out an ectopic pregnancy, cervical swabs for nucleic acid amplification testing for chlamydia and gonorrhea, a wet mount of vaginal secretions looking for polymorphonuclear vaginal cells indicating vaginal infection. Absence of these have a 94.5% negative predictive value. Bloods, including full blood count, ESR or CRP, may also be done. Imaging studies, such as transvaginal ultrasound or CT, are indicated when an abscess or alternative pathology is suspected, or if the pelvic exam is limited by pain. Laparoscopy remains the gold standard and can visualise pelvic structures directly, but it is mostly reserved for uncertain cases or in those cases with a lack of response to treatment. Treatment involves early initiation of empirical antibiotic therapy, as even days of treatment delay can result in impaired longer-term fertility. In milder cases, where hospitalisation is not needed, there are multiple regimens possible, but one first-line option includes keftriaxone 500mg intramuscularly as a single dose and doxycycline 100mg orally twice a day for 14 days and metronidazole 400mg orally twice a day for 14 days. For those requiring hospitalisation, such as severe illness or the inability to tolerate oral treatment, a suspected abscess, pregnancy or poor clinical response, Intravenous therapy can include a similar regimen of keftriaxone with doxycycline and metronidazole. Tubo ovarian abscess may require drainage guided by ultrasound or CT in addition to antibiotic therapy. Surgical intervention is needed if rupture occurs or if the abscess fails to resolve. Treatment of sexual partners for gonorrhea and chlamydia is essential to prevent reinfection along with abstinence during therapy until confirmed cure.